Well, it's a pleasure to welcome today Aurora Program Jones to the Casos Institute seminar. Um, so me and Aurora have been collaborating for quite some time and we did our PhD um, at the same university. So Aurora did her PhD at the University of California, Irvine, um, and then has done a postdoc, uh, postdoctoral fellowship at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab and UC Berkeley. And a few years ago, she, she started as an assistant professor at UC Merced, where she currently is. And yeah, we have been working together, collaborating on some topics. We have uh, currently, we're being funded right by Casus on one topic uh, on Casus Open Project. So it's, it's a great pleasure to have you here today. And I'll hand over to you, Aurora. Thanks, Attila. I um, please do let me know if anything happens with the sound or anything like that. I'm happy to switch over to headphones as necessary. Um, so I'm I'm very very excited to be here. I wish I were there in person. Hopefully in September we'll be able to be there um, <laughs> uh, together in person. Um, I. I am at the University of California Merced, and I'm going to give a sort of a sampling of some of the work that I do around temperature um, because of the interest in matter under extreme conditions and um, high energy density science there at CASUS. Um, but at the end, I'll give sort of, um, you know, a rapid fire sampling of some of the current work going on. But this, this time I'm going to be focusing a lot on work that's about um, how we use the adiabatic connection formalism to explore how temperature and interaction strength and um, density scaling are all related um, in density functional theory. But before I do that, I wanted to sort of give you all a picture of where I'm actually sitting today at five, as you mentioned, Attila. So it is it is still dark here, um, but if it were if it were light out, you would be able to see probably a lot of the fog. It's very foggy here during the season because we are in the Central Valley of California. Um, University of California Merced is the latest, the newest um, campus of the University of California. It was founded in 2005 only. Um, and you can see here that we are sort of in between a lot of beautiful places. Most people who come to Merced are on their way to Yosemite National Park um, in order to see some of the beautiful landmarks that we have there. Um, this is land that was on um, the ancestral home of the Yokuts, um, and we are growing very rapidly. At one point, we had a 600% growth rate. So um, I know that Casus is also growing rapidly and understands this kind of thing. So I feel a special kinship with you all. Um, and uh, we, we are pointed toward 10,000 folks, um, and we're getting there very quickly. Um, one thing that is pretty exceptional about U University of California Merced is that we are about three quarters first generation college students. So students who do not have um, people in their immediate family who have gone to college before. So um, we, are, uh, we are working on the mission of the University of California to be an engine for social mobility in California. And um, our faculty and graduate student body are also growing really, really quickly. Um, so we're excited about our, our research and, um, and justice missions that we have at UC Merced. More specifically, I'm going to see. This is not going forward as I expected it to. I'll go over here. Perfect. Okay. So um, more specifically, at University of California Merced, I'm a member of the Center for Chemical Computation and Theory, CCCAT. Um, you can see that we have our bobcat mascot here. Um, we are the bobcats at UC Merced, and this is a department of a U.S. Department of Energy funded um, collaboration between. Um, a bunch of the junior theorists at um, UC Merced in both chemistry and physics. And in particular, we're focused toward um, developing methods for better simulations and calculations around transition metal chemistry. Um, perhaps, more, uh, <laughs> perhaps more relevant to what I'm going to talk to you about today, I'm also a member of the Department of Energy funded Consortium for High Energy Density Science, or CFEDS. Um, I'm one of two PIs at um, two investigators at University of California Merced, along with David Struba, who's the lead for our, for our campus. And this is a collaboration with Florida A&M, uh, Morehouse College, and Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And we're focused on developing computational methods um, for matter under extreme temperature and pressure, um, much as some of you are there. 
And in particular, we're also interested in developing educational pathways um, that lead all the way from high school, um, secondary school, right, all the way up through um, postdoctoral and staff positions at national laboratories. And so we're very interested in thinking about what you do to train people to work in high energy density science, which is those of you who work in it know, is very a very interdisciplinary field and it's hard to actually be trained in high, high energy density science at the academic level and often involves a lot of apprenticing um, at the professional level. So we're trying to think about whether that is the best way to do that or not and how we recruit and retain um, uh, a diverse workforce for the Department of Energy and beyond. So this is my group. Um, and uh, we have a mixture of undergraduate, um, graduate and postdoctoral folks working with me. And um, a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about today is sort of the things that, um, so as Attila mentioned, we're funded um, through an open project. And that's in this area of my research in ensemble density functional theory, um, or, but also sort of bridging over here into thermal density functional theory, working on inversion methods. Most of what I'm gonna be talking about today lies over here where, um, you know, we use a lot of um, formal arguments to think about limiting conditions of um, electronic structure methods. And in particular, we think about how to include temperature effects into those methods and what it means when we do that and what it means when we approximate those things. I'll talk a little bit as well about the strong correlation limits, um, which is uh, an idea about re-referencing density functional theory, um, starting instead of from a non-interacting system and thinking about adding in correlation, but starting with an infinitely interacting system and relaxing back into a realistic amount of correlation for real systems um, and seeing how that affects things, particularly at um, finite temperature. So when we have temperature effects and explicit temperature dependence in that system as well. So I, I'm not going to lean too heavily into the motivation here, but I know that I don't only have um, matter for extreme condition scientists here. So I wanted to make sure that I gave everyone a good context for why I work on these things. Um, a lot of the electronic structure methods that um, I was trained to use in graduate school um, and beyond a lot of the things that we use in general, our ground state, um, our ground state methods, which means that we're really only interested in the lowest possible energy state for um, our systems. But when we start looking at things that have accessible excited states, either because the energies of those excited states are low enough, close enough to the ground state that they're easily accessible, or because the conditions in which we find our system are high enough temperature. Um, that they can be accessed by having more energy available in the system, we need to include non-negligible occupations of the excited states in the ways that we think about calculating electronic structure. So some of the places where you might find these things is in topological phase transitions, um, thinking about the cores of giant planets. This is Jupiter. You can tell because it sort of looks like, you know, some sort of parfait or ice cream on the outside. That's how in a cartoon, you, you tell somebody that you're looking at Jupiter. They're here, they're talking about giant planets. So you want planets that are big enough that you have very dense cores on the inside um, and high temperatures on the inside. You also find these conditions on the pathway to the ignition of inertial confinement fusion capsules. Um, and uh, other, other situations where materials are under extreme conditions here. This is a simulation um, where uh, by Valencia and coworkers where you're looking at electronic structure changes where you're actually looking at differences in bonding based on um, being at um, you know, a different environment that's higher temperature and where you can see that with um, sheets of materials here. Today, I'm gonna to be focusing mostly on these areas, right? Um, thinking about, about ways of writing down theory that um, are useful for thinking about these high temperature, high pressure conditions, um, which again is something that I think a lot of people at your institute are in interested in and is of interest to a lot of my collaborators at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory um, and Sandia La National Laboratory. Um, some of those things, the, the reason why we have a lot of national laboratory interest in the US is because um, in order to create these conditions on Earth instead of out in, um, out in space, um, you know, I cannot travel to the center of Jupiter, but maybe I can travel to Livermore or Berkeley or Sandia, New Mexico, um, uh, over there in Albuquerque, where they have these um, major facilities. Similarly, I know that there are a lot of facilities in Europe that try to achieve these conditions as well. Um, here we have um, 
the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore. This is the Z machine at Sandia. And this is the advanced light source at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. And there we are thinking about how can we use you know, big science in order to create these rather extreme conditions. And you need to do that because you need to have high enough temperatures that these thermal effects that I'm interested in pursuing are, are um, have impact. It's high enough temperature that they have impact, but also that you need to have these densities that are high enough that you still have quantum mechanical behavior, right? Things are close enough that they notice their neighbors and you have quantum effects being important so that you're not just using standard plasma um, physics techniques, plasma physics techniques um, or strictly semi-classical methods. So when we look at these sorts of things, um, usually the area that I'm interested in is here in this loosely defined region of phase space called warm dense matter. Um, some people term this the malfunction junction, which I like because I like rhymes. Um, the malfunction junction is called that because as we're looking at um, the methods that have been most developed, we might be looking at plasma physics, as I mentioned before, where we're looking at hot plasmas, um, which are, these methods don't have enough of the, uh, generally don't have enough of the quantum mechanical effects that we're used to seeing um, in warm dense matter. And where I was trained, right, um, and where a lot of us were trained is down here in solid um, and liquid phases where you need to have um, methods like cold quantum mechanics, right? So maybe condensed matter physics, quantum chemistry. And down here, we don't actually have enough of the explicit temperature dependence mattering for these methods to necessarily have, um, have ability to deal with the explicit temperature dependence that you find um, when you heat these methods up. The other issue is that when you look to, to include temperature dependence in these things, you get very, very high computational cost. So as we heat things up and move from, you know, these solids that we're used to thinking about, we're going to move into warm dense matter. And ideally, we would be able to predict how well something might work in that area, but also in regimes that are close to it. Part of the reason why is because when we look at something like the National Ignition Facility or other places where they're working on inertial confinement fusion, you're starting from this cold deuterium ice, something like that, and you're covering this, this um, capsule, this tiny capsule with something like beryllium doped plastic or um, you know, carbon, uh, generally something that is um, coating that, uh, coating that deuterium core. And when you place that inside of the gold hull room or some other way of um, generating x-rays, you want to irradiate that thing with a lot of um, symmetry. And once you do that, you can heat up that, that covering. And when it blasts off, it um, compresses the fuel inside enough that you can hopefully implode it and you know, release some energy. When you're doing that, as I said, you're starting from, from, from a solid, from this deuterium ice, moving through the warm dense matter regime all the way up into here where we see that we have the inertial confinement fusion capsule at ignition. So if you are trying to model these things, not only are you working across a lot of different length scales um, and thinking about multi-scale modeling, you also need to make sure that if you are predicting the um, the accuracy of your method that you're not just talking about a specific phase of matter but that you're able to talk about how it connects to other phases of matter as well. Um, the reason why this is important is that we find that um, the methods that we choose to use to model these materials has a lot to do with how we not only interpret the data that comes out of warm dense matter experiments or high energy density uh, experimental uh, um, pursuits, we also need to be able to use these theories in order to design um, design experiments because these are fairly high cost experiments and we want to make sure that we're doing a good job um, in supporting experimental colleagues in doing that. Um, one of the most um, popular ways of, of calculating properties of these materials shares, um, shares a method with a lot of other methods out there, with a lot of other experimental um, pursuits out there, not just at high temperature, and that's using density functional theory um, in tandem with other, with other methods as well. So I'm going to go next. So now that I've sort of motivated why I care about warm dense matter, I'm going to move, um, I'm going to move into talking about density functional theory in general. This is a pretty brief overview, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page about the sort of the home that I grew up in and thinking about moving away from zero temperature into the temperature, the um, finite temperatures that we care about um, under these extreme conditions. 
So as I mentioned, density functional theory is a very popular method. Most of these citations are not from high energy density science, right? This is happening across chemistry, physics, material science, biochemistry, all sorts of fields. And it's because density functional theory is a really useful balance of computational efficiency and accuracy for um, systems in which quantum mechanics is important. Um, and you can see over here that we have, this is, this is only goes up to 2013, um, but on the, on the y-axis here, we have the units in kilopapers, right? So, you know, you're talking about, you know, more than 30,000 citations a year at this point, um, by some counts. Um, and so the idea is that if we can improve these methods, whether it's for zero temperature or finite temperature, we're actually impacting a lot of calculations that happen, um, that happen um, day to day in a variety of scientific disciplines. Um, in particular, we're hoping that by improving thermal density functional theory and our understanding of it, we might be able to use insights there to improve things like correlation energy approximations and things like that, that we need at zero temperature as well. Um, and that's because, as I mentioned, we don't only find these therm thermal density functional theory um, effects being important at extreme conditions. We also see at any time that we have um, small energy differences between the ground or lowest energy state and the excited states that are um, close by to that. So this actually happens quite a bit when you have um, certain kinds of excitations that you might find in biochemical systems, um, functional materials, uh, or anything that sort of wiggles a bit. Right? You might have excitations that are um, that are close to the ground state and energy. And in that case, you might want to have a method that deals not only with strictly looking at that, that lowest energy state, but states that are above that as well, and something that is formally rigorous enough that you can predict how it should work and how, how approximations work in those conditions. So if we start with zero temperature, we have some, some assumptions or warnings to the user, right? So we want to make sure that we are thinking at zero temperature just about that ground state. So we're going to talk about non-relativistic electrons here, which is um, which also are sitting in a fixed external potential set up by the ionic centers around there. So um, this is the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. So we're assuming that the ionic centers are heavy and slow enough that we can effectively think of them as static. Um, the electrons live in this um, external potential energy landscape. And we're going to be using atomic units and the things that I write down just because it's a little bit cleaner um, when we're thinking about the logic of these problems. And in general, I'm talking about a spin unpolarized system that we can add spin to density functional theory. And in practice, um, almost all calculations um, are done with spin DFT, spin density functional theory. If we think about setting up a Hamiltonian for this, um, we, we have a standard electronic Hamiltonian where we have a kinetic energy operator, an electron-electron repulsion operator, and um, V here is this external potential that's set up by the ionic centers um, within which these electrons live. If we want to look at those more carefully, we have this kinetic or, you know, this motion energy that we have um, defined this way. And we also have our electron-electron repulsion where we're looking at um, something that depends just on the distance between pairs of electrons. Um, and this is our standard Coulomb operator here. And this is our one body external potential. Note that it's time independent. And, um, and in this situation, right, we are assuming that these are, um, this, this is not moving in any way and that we can treat it just as a parametric dependence for the energy. This is a pretty complicated problem in general. Um, we would like to not have to solve a bunch of coupled differential equations that depend on the positions and velocities of all of these electrons, depending on the positions of one another. Um, this is a pretty complicated problem, right? It's famously difficult to solve. Uh, in 1964, Hohenberg and Cohn um, established this mapping between not only the external potential, the landscape that sort of defines our quantum mechanical problem, and um, it, it allowed us to not only go through that potential to the wave function, right, which is a state descriptor that tells us um, all the information we need to know about our system to figure out properties um, and behavior of our system, but through um, this theorem, you're able to map from the potential all the way to the, the electronic probability density. And once you do that, what you get is a way of saying that we 
if we have this one-to-one -one correspondence between the potential and the density, you should be able to also say that the ground state energy, that lowest possible energy state for the quantum mechanical system in question, depends only on the electronic probability density. This is a lot easier in, in, uh, in theory because we don't anymore have to track the individual electrons in order to solve this problem. Now we can just point to a position in 3D space and say right here, what's the probability of finding an electron there? This is a three-dimensional, you know, this depends on three-dimensional space instead of, you know, N, uh, you know, a very large number of coordinates instead. That's a much easier problem to solve in theory. Um, and the second part of this work that was important is not only that we had this mapping from the external potential to the electronic probability density, but that we could write it as a functional, right? So we take as our input, um, we take as our input a function and we receive outside of that, our output will be um, a number. And as we look at this, we can actually split this into pieces. So here we have our um, electronic Hamiltonian that we talked about before with our kinetic electron electron repulsion and external potential operators. Um, what we can do is break this into two pieces. The first piece contains only the kinetic and electron electron interaction pieces, and there's therefore universal for all electronic systems. Those, those components of the energy don't change in their description from one electronic system to the next. Um, people call this um, sometimes the Holmberg cone functional or the universal functional to note that it, it doesn't change from system to system. The rest of the energy also depends on the, the electronic probability density and uh, represents the system dependent piece that depends on the external potential of which those electrons find themselves for your particular system of interest. Note here that this universal functional is a functional of the density. So in theory, all we need to do is know our electronic, our ground state electronic density, and we can get back our ground state energy. Now, sadly, this is not a constructive proof, so we don't have any way to just write down what that functional is. But a clever idea came from Cohn and Sean in 1965. Um, and the idea there is that if all we need is the ground state density, why don't we solve a different problem that's related to the one that we're interested in through that ground state density? So the idea here is mapping the interacting system that we care about to a non-interacting system with the same electronic density. Um, and if we can do that based on this idea that the ground state energy really only cares about that density um, in this formalism, we should be able to solve this easier to solve um, problem and get a result back that's still useful for the problem that we care about. And so the way that they did this is they said, well, let's think about non-interacting particles instead of electrons. These are non-interacting fermions that don't, um, don't interact with each other and exist in a separate kind of one body potential. So here, instead of having this be our external potential, we have something called the cone sham potential or the single body potential that is um, going to create uh, an electronic density that is exactly the same as the interacting density that we care about, but is constructed from these non-interacting um, electrons. When we do this, we get a uh, system of eigen, uh, eigenvalue equations that we need to solve, which is, um, the bottleneck, the main, the main solving that you need to do when you use cone sham density functional theory. It's how a lot of supercomputing time is used in the world because it's used so often. And if we look at this, we can construct this density from these non-interacting orbitals, um, these cone sham orbitals, um, square, the modulus squared of those multiplied by their occupations. Um, and we can when we do this, what we can do is define um, something called the exchange correlation energy. So what that does is it says, okay, so this is our universal piece that we are trying to figure out, this universal functional that doesn't depend on the system that we're in. By changing this into a non-interacting problem, we can solve exactly for the non-interacting the non-interacting or cone sham kinetic energy here. The single particle kinetic energy lets us just find the kinetic energy of each state and add them up. Um, and then we can also use the Coulomb energy, which is the classical electrostatic repulsion, um, which we know in terms of the density itself. And between these two pieces, we, we get the vast majority of this um, Holmberg cone functional correct. We know that this is exactly right if we have the exact density and if we have the exact cone sham functions. What remains is this exchange correlation piece, which we don't have a constructive, uh, we don't have an explicit form for, but we know that it should be pretty small. 
Um, and so when we inevitably have to approximate this, we're hoping that the errors in the overall energy will be small. The issue is that though it is small, this piece is crucial. We know that this piece is involved in bonding and a lot of electronic properties that are critical for um, actually determining the properties of electronic systems that we care about. And so a lot of the density functional theory field is involved in either using approximations to this exchange correlation energy or in developing new ones. Some of us sit around and, and analyze this, these approximations or think about this thing in, an, in its exact form in order to get insights into how to improve um, the way that we actually do density functional theory calculations in practice. When we do this, we set up a formalism in which we want these electronic densities to match. So this is a, just a, a simple example. Um, and so here we have the helium atom, and this is a two electron system, so we can solve it exactly. And so um, on the top here, you have the radial density. So as we start at R equals zero, this is the nucleus of our helium atom. And as we move along the x-axis, we get further and further away. And you can see here that our exact electronic density is shown in blue. Um, and the exact external potential for a helium atom is this red curve, negative two over R. Um, and if we look at this, our exact cone sham potential is different as we would expect, right? So if we take non-interacting electrons instead of the interacting ones that make up our real helium density, and instead of placing them in this red potential, we place them in the exact cone sham potential here, um, we get back a density that looks exactly the same um, to the eye here as we would have um, for the helium atom. And this is actually true because this is the exact cone sham potential. In practice, we do need to approximate this. So a, a popular approximation here listed in green looks like this for the potential, which you can see is a pretty big difference than the exact cone sham potential that we would be expecting. But when we look back at the density that it provides back, we actually see that it's highly accurate even as an approximated density. So all of these different, all of these um, approximations are focused on getting this density correct, which is as it should be, right? Because that's really what we care about based on the holmberg cone theorem. We wanna make sure that our um, approximate densities are as close to the interaction densities as possible in order to get um, in order to, to get a close approximation to the ground state energy. That last piece of the energy, the exchange correlation energy is often split into pieces. Sometimes you wanna keep it together. Sometimes you wanna split it into pieces depending on the connections that you're making um, with other theories or based on the analysis that you're doing or what's available to you. Um, and when you do that, you can say that the exchange energy is the difference between the electron-electron potential evaluated on um, the cone sham system, that instead of non-interacting um, or non-interacting electrons creating the same density as your interacting system, with the um, classical electrostatic repulsion subtracted off of it, or you can defer, define it in terms of these cone sham orbitals. So I told you that spin does exist in density functional theory, despite the fact that I pretend it doesn't exist in most of my talk. And if you do that, you can see that this is a same spin effect, um, and you can define it in terms of those cone sham orbitals here. Now, this is a density functional theory definition of the exchange, which is related to, but slightly different than um, definitions that you might find in other electronic structure techniques. Um, once you've defined your exchange, correlation is sort of everything else, um, though you can also think of the exchange, as I'll talk about later, the exchange can be thought of as sort of the high density limit of this object, and then the, the correlation energy is, again, everything that's left after that. So that's sort of the zero temperature picture. I know that was a little bit quick, but um, I know some people here are familiar with it. Um, if we're think interested in, in moving to systems where temperature is important, we need to actually include um, temperature dependence in the, in, in the formalism uh, that we're using. Now, this isn't necessarily the case in a lot of warm dense matter simulations because we actually don't have a ton of these developed yet, though there's a lot of work by um, Sjostrom and Tricky and other folks and uh, Karasiev um, in these areas. And uh, what, what, what people generally do if they don't have those implemented is that they will just take a thermally weighted density and they will plug it into the zero temperature formalism and um, maybe approximate your um, entropy that you would get at a 
at a finite temperature using a non-interacting entropy, sort of a configurational entropy calculation. Now, this works surprisingly well, which is why people do it a lot, and it's why density functional theory is still used, even though there's still development that needs to be done in the thermal area, um, because it captures a lot of the, um, the free energy effects, so like the kinetic and entropic pieces um, that you need. But we know that the exchange correlation in particular should be temperature dependent. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what that looks like now. I'm going to check my time here. Okay. So thermal density functional theory or finite temperature density functional theory is um, very closely related. You'll see a lot of analogs to the zero temperature formalism here. Um, this was um, derived by Merman in 1965. Um, and actually, you can see uh, finite temperature density functional theory in the original uh, Concham paper as well in 1965, um, where they were thinking about um, some conductivities as well. So here, instead of looking at that, that ground state energy, um, the lowest possible energy state for your system, here we shift our, our focus to the grand canonical potential operator. And so this has our same electronic Hamiltonian in it that we talked about before for the ground state problem. But now we have a thermally weighted entropy term, um, uh, as well as a chemical potential weighted number operator term. So let's look at what these operators look like. The, um, when we want to define our entropy, we use a statistical operator. And if you're um, not doing anything too, too formal with this, you can think of this just as sort of like an analog to the wave function in that it's a state descriptor. It describes the state that you're in. Um, and so here you have this outer product of these um, n-body wave functions, and you have these statistical weights here. Generally, um, you're using Boltzmann weights, though for the non-interacting Concham system, we'll see that you can use Fermi weights um, because they're effectively the same <laughs> in that situation. But these statistical weights are related to the connection between um, thermal density functional theory and ensemble density functional theory and in general. Um, but when we have these weights and these statistical operators, we can describe our state well. And we also see that it's dependent on the inverse temperature here, beta. Um, and this allows us to define our entropy operator as just the natural log of this thing with our Boltzmann weight here. And in general, the same way you would do for any sort of density matrix based theory, you can calculate your observables by either, you, you can calculate your observables by taking a trace um, of that statistical operator times the um, operator itself for the observable that you're interested in, which you can also rewrite just as like a double sum where you're looking at these matrix elements, um, where you're, you're looking at um, sort of an average over all of the observables measurements over all of these different states weighted by the statistical weightings that you had in your original state here. Finite temperature conjam proceeds a lot the same way that it does at zero temperature, where we're looking at a mapping between a non-interacting system and our system of interest that is fully interacting, like realistically interacting between electrons. Um, the difference here is that now you have an external potential in which these non-interacting electrons sit that is temperature dependent, and the orbitals, the eigenstates for those, are also temperature dependent, as are their eigen corresponding eigenvalues. Um, what this means is that uh, you're gonna you're gonna need to think about temperature dependence um, of your exchange correlation approximations in there in that the temperature dependence will be explicit. It's not something that just comes in from having density dependence on the temperature. Um, and so if we do this, we we still define things the same way. We have the density at some temperature tau. Um, being defined by the um, sum over all of these states, but here we're waiting here. I'm, I just showed it as the Fermi weightings, but you could also use the Boltzmann weights um, in, if you think about how to connect those two things um, for non-interacting systems. So here we have our, our, weighted, um, our weighted density, our thermally weighted density. And what's different here is that we do not only populate the lowest energy states, now we have fractional occupation of states that go um, above the lowest energy possible. And so this is part of, this is sort of the root of a lot of the increased computational cost of density functional theory um, at non-zero temperatures, is that, you know, especially at these higher temperatures that we're interested in with warm dense matter, you have a lot of states being populated and that means that our eigen system solve becomes much more onerous. 
In practice, we're often interested in the free energies of these things, either because we're actually working in the canonical ensemble, um, because we know how many electrons we have, we don't actually have electron fluctuations like you would have in the grand canonical ensemble, um, or because we are really thinking very carefully about free energies because we're focused on this exchange correlation, which is a free energy as well. So if we look at that, if we look at these as free energies, we can look at the relationship between the interacting system, which we have written out here. Um, so this is like your Helmholtz free energy. And you can think about this in terms of the interacting system um, as we have on the top here, or in your cone sham system, your non-interacting system down here. And what we have um, that's different is that now we have, instead of this, um, instead of this interacting kinetic and entropy um, set of terms here, now we have non-interacting kinetic energy and entropy. Um, which we talk about as the kentropy because this unit of the um, temperature um, temperature dependent kinetic energy and its temperature weighted entropy term, this unit here is actually what you minimize in um, um, finite temperature cone sham. So we actually think about this free energy quite a bit. So we name it the kentropy, kinetic energy and entropy together. Um, but you can see that instead of just having your electron electron interaction in the interacting system as well as your external potential, now we we have um, your cone sham system where you have this Hartree or classical electrostatic energy, as well as your external potential and this exchange correlation free energy that comes from, you know, this is our, our thinking about our cone sham potential here. If we do this, we can define our exchange correlation free energy, which now not only has kinetic and potential pieces, which is what you would have in the ground state, you also have an entropy piece here. Um, you can rewrite this in various ways, as I mentioned before. Um, and one thing that is key, because this is what's minimized in cone sham density functional theory, is you actually get exchange um, kinetic, a kinetic piece of the exchange energy, which is unusual for people that are used to dealing with um, ground state DFT. And that's because um, overall, you don't have um, first order changes to the kentropy, but you do have it for you could have it as long as it's in the kinetic energy as long as it's balanced by a similar change in the entropy term okay maybe i'll go back and just say this is what i look at a lot of this piece here this is exchange correlation free energy often i'm looking just at the correlation piece of this um, and uh, in order to do that i want to look at not just the approximate versions of this thing but i think a lot about the exact formalism and how I can um, look at its structure, its con you know the conditions that it has on it, um, in order to tell me something about how I expect it to behave. And so, how do I do that? Um, some of the tools that I use um, are thinking about scaling conditions. So one thing, one kind of scaling that we might think about is density scaling. So density scaling is norm conserving. So we're not changing the number of particles here. Um, all we're thinking about is changing our coordinate scaling, basically. And that effectively says, if I have some original density like this black curve here, I can either scale it to stretch it out or I can scale it to squeeze it, but it keeps the number of electrons the same. So my norm is conserved. Um, but when I do this, um, I know that from certain conditions on uh, my functionals that I can tell you something about what happens to um, certain pieces of my energy, particularly non-interacting energies that you find in the cone sham system, I can tell you what happens to those when I, when I squeeze or stretch their input density. And what happens is that I get something out that has a scaling relationship, a direct scaling relationship here. Um, and so what that means is if I can, I can use this um, relationship to figure out without having to actually scale things um, in practice, I can think about what those energies would look like um, just through the scaling relationship. This isn't, it's not that hard to scale a density. And so this isn't that useful on its own for my purposes, but I combine it particularly at finite temperature. When we do this, I can think about scaling the temperature. Um, and the reason I need to do that is because in order to maintain this quadratic scaling that we get for certain non-interacting um, pieces of the energy functional, I need to scale the dense. I don't need to only scale the density. I also need to scale this temperature as well by, um, by a, a specific factor related to how I scaled my density. So you can see here that if I, this is a very um, simple and silly example here where I have um, infinitely high walls in one dimension, right? And I just think about adding an electron in there. And as I change the temperature, that this, this um, 
this imaginary electron, right? It falls in there at zero, you know, when it's pretty cold or, you know, pretty cool, it's tepid. It's at this pretty familiar looking wave function that you have in blue. And then as we heat it up, it spreads out towards those walls. Um, and you can see how, if we think about this, you might have um, different effects happening based on whether you're scaling your density and spreading it out toward those walls or scaling the temperature. And in order to get this quadratic behavior, we really need to scale both in the thermal DFT theory. Um, I also, and here's where I actually um, sort of have all of these pieces coming together. We can also use tools um, uh, about scaled interaction strength. So if I want to, now notice here, I no longer have those S subscripts. So this means that for an interacting system or for components that aren't just from the cone sham non-interacting system, I can actually write down um, these same scale, these same quadratic scaling relationships. If I not only scale the interact, the uh, temperature and the density, but also scale the interaction strength. And so if I do that, I can still get these um, nice scaling relationships back um, for my energy functionals. And so the idea is that I go from, this lambda is looking at how strong my interaction is. So how strong that electron-electron repulsion is in my term. And when I do that, I hold my density to be fixed. And a lot of the pictures that I'm using, gonna be using next, because I'm using something called the adiabatic connection formalism. And the idea is that as I move from lambda equals zero to lambda equals one, I smoothly change my potential. So that's like going from this red potential um, to this yellow potential all the while holding this density fixed. And I do that by changing the interaction strength as I go. Now, in order to do this written this way, I would need to make sure that I knew the value of the potential piece of the exchange correlation at every value of lambda. Um, so for every value of the interaction strength. And for some model systems, we know what that is. But in general, when you're looking at either parameterizing something um, from highly accurate calculations or some other form from which you're getting this exchange correlation potential, you might not know that. You might only know it for real interaction strength. And if you only know it that way, you can use these scaling, in, these scaling relationships in tandem with this in order to build these curves. So that's, um, that's what we're gonna do um, in the rest of this talk. So if we wanna think about what this integral back here, just to go back, this integral here, this adiabatic connection formula, what that looks like, here's a, a cartoon of um, how we can draw out that integrand. So that integrand is the black curve here, and this is at zero temperature, which is where, if anybody's seen this, probably this is where they've seen it before, is at zero temperature. Um, and you can see that along the bottom here, I have interaction strength going from zero to one. Um, up here is my x-axis, so this is all negative. Um, and I can, if I draw this out, what this allows me to do is have a pictorial representation of proportions of the exchange and correlation as I change from the non-interacting cone sham system um, all the way smoothly with the same density to the interacting system that we care about over here at lambda equals one. And this lets me look at energy components. It allows me to think about um, approximations that we might use. Um, and it lets me get back exactly what the exchange correlation energy is if I can get an exact expression for this integrand, um, this black curve here. Now, because I'm interested in um, finite temperature systems, um, if we turn on the temperature, we can do a very similar thing. But here, our finite temperature adiabatic connection integrand sort of moves moves up if we have um, a fixed density and we change the temperature. As we increase the temperature, it's going to scoot up. And we're gonna see that our exchange free energy reduces, but we can use the same sort of idea to get out pieces of, um, to, to look at the, the, relative, um, the relative strengths of exchange and correlation um, that we get for different temperatures and density conditions, and particularly as we turn on this interaction strength. Um, this also allows you to get at um, information about the um, kinetic in the zero temperature case or the kentropic correlation here because of its relationship to the um, correlation free energy. So if we look at what this looks like with an equation, we get something that looks like this, where I can say I can express the exchange correlation free energy at some temperature tau and at some interaction strength lambda as um, 
the integral over lambda of this integrand, this is the black curve, and we can write that as the potential exchange correlation over the interaction strength here, again, knowing it at every interaction strength. So in order to use this um, for real systems, I'm gonna use something that was um, a parameterization of the exchange correlation free energy for the uniform electron gas, gas that was made by um, Groth and coworkers as well as some of the people who might be here today. And so what we wanna do from that is take, um, if we have good information about the exchange correlation for the uniform electron gas, as I mentioned, we can scale to a high density limit and pull out just the exchange piece of that free energy. And we call this simulated scaling based on some zero temperature work um, that was done uh, uh, by Burke and Liu. Um, and so, and I think in 2009, um, and the simulated scaling is saying, okay, maybe we don't know what the value of the exchange of, of this potential piece is. Maybe we don't know what that is at every single interaction strength value along that curve. But what we can do is relate through scaling relationships to a density scaling. Um, and that will allow us to draw this curve even if we don't have information about that other than at the fully interacting strength. And so what we do is we take um, this limit to pull off the exchange um, at the beginning. And you can see that since we're at thermal, uh, since we're at um, non-zero temperatures, we not only have to scale the density, here we're doing it in terms of the wigner zeitz radius, which is how we generally express the density for the uniform electron gas, um, especially in these parameterizations we're gonna use. We also have to not, so not just the density, but we also have to scale the temperature at the same time. Once we do that, we have a measure of the exchange free energy um, at, at that specific temperature and density or wigner zeitz radius. Once we do that, we can pull this off and we'll get um, just the correlation piece. And we're gonna combine that with some of these scaling relationships. In particular, we can take the exchange correlation free energy at some temperature tau and interaction strength lambda. And we say that we know that this is equal to some scaled value of the exchange correlation free energy. As long as we scale the density and we scale the temperature, we can just calculate this and then multiply it by our quadratic scaling factor. And we'll be able to get all of the values along the adiabatic connection curve that we need. So we do that, if we combine this idea with the idea that we can pull off the exchange and just get the correlation, um, we can combine it with some um, other relationships between the correlation, these differential and integral relationships um, that are from my PhD work. And we can, we can write down the connect, the, um, potential piece of the correlation that we need in terms of only the correlation free energy that we're able to extract at this point. So this is gonna, what's gonna let us draw those curves that we need in order to analyze how the exchange and correlation um, are related to one another um, for thermal systems um, and in particular the um, uniform electron gas at non-zero temperatures. So this is work that's mostly done by my graduate student, Brittany Harding. Um, and you can see here that what, what she's been able to do is use these ideas about simulated scaling and this parameterization by Groth and coworkers from 2017. Um, and you can use this to um, draw these curves at different temperatures and density conditions or different temperatures and Wigner sites radii. Um, here she's holding the radius fixed. So here we have a, uh, the same density across these different um, across these different curves, but she's increasing the temperature as we go from blue to green to red. Um, and here um, in the larger picture, we have just the exchange correlation. So if we look at this, she's only drawn in the exchange line here for the hottest temperature. Um, but you can imagine that you have a green dotted line coming across from the lambda equals zero value, as well as a blue dotted line here. And you can see that as you go from lambda equals zero to lambda equals one for all of these, you turn on the correlation, so to speak. And that means that you're going to have your exchange correlation um, adiabatic connection integrand dipping down below here. And you can see that um, the exchange goes down as you increase the temperature at this constant density. Um, and you might be surprised to see that um, you actually have, uh, if, you, if you look at the inset here, you have um, just the correlation energy. And as you increase the temperature, you actually see the correlation getting larger in magnitude, right? So this is just pulling off the correlation piece. And you can see that if you integrate between zero and one, you're looking at the 
area between say this red curve and the axis here. And that, that integral is getting larger and larger as your temperatures increase for just the correlation. This is sort of different than what we're used to thinking about um, for correlation. A lot of the time we talk about correlation and temperature being competing um, influences on an electronic system. But in reality, depending on the conditions that you're in, correlation, um, it can, correlation is non-monotonic with temperature. And so sometimes you find that increasing your temperature will actually cause your correlation to go up. And you can sort of get back to the behavior that we're used to thinking about by including the exchange. And here you see that as we increase the temperature going from blue to green to red, we actually see the magnitude of our exchange correlation going down with increasing temperature, which is more in line with what people think about intuitively when they're, they're sort of um, conceptualizing this, com this competition between interaction strength and temperature. This is, this is true for exchange. Exchange has a pretty straightforward um, relationship with temperature, but correlation is more complicated. What we actually use this for um, in Brittany's work and working with undergraduate Zachary Mowry um, is to think about um, whether we could have the same sorts of relationships with ex between exchange and the exchange correlation energy that we see at zero temperature. So a lot of the time, um, when you think about um, how big can the exchange correlation get, um, or how big can correlation get for electronic systems? You think about something called the Lieb-Oxford bound, which is, you know, a mathematically derived, like an actual bound. Um, I don't do actual bounds. I'm not a mathematician, right? Um, I do these sorts of numerical approximations to bounds with this work. Um, but here, what we wanted to do is say, okay, the Lieb-Oxford bound um, has a form that looks a lot like the exchange energy for um, the uniform electron gas at zero temperature. And so what we wanted to do is see if a similar relationship existed with the exchange correlation free energy um, and whether we could bound these curves, whether we would see these curves going lower than the exchange energy or the exchange free energy um, times a, the same constant. And what we find is that though it does sometimes hold, the zero temperature bound always holds, which is good because it's supposed to be on all matter. Um, and so we didn't, we didn't break physics um, slash our own uh, code by doing this wrong. So we see that the zero temperature, whether you're looking at the, um, the earlier bounds or these later bounds as they tighten them up, um, you see that these curves never dip below there. But if we try to do the same sort of relationship that we know exists at zero temperature with the finite temperature exchange free energy, we find that it doesn't hold once you get to lower density. So this very large wigner zeitz radius um, is the same as having a pretty low density. Um, and so as we go to higher and higher temperatures, but even at low temperatures here, um, for low densities, we find that this relationship really doesn't hold. And so we can't make the same um, idea, we can't make the same connection between um, this bound on these curves and just the exchange as it's described for the, the uniform electron gas. That sort of gets disrupted once you go to finite temperatures where you have this really, um, this very explicit temperature dependence on the exchange. And as you turn it on, it really starts to shrink and you see that these curves really rise up, um, especially once you're in a low density regime. Um, and you can see here, like even, even for um, a non-interacting system, this doesn't work. So even without turning on correlation, you can really just pop right past this bound. But what this got us thinking about was, is there, is, you know, there's some evidence and some work that I've done before um, that's, it, um, that there is a possibility of a temperature dependent bound that we should be looking for here. Um, and so we started thinking, what could we say about what this constant is? So this is just using the um, leave oxford constant that you have at zero temperature. And we see that it really doesn't work very well here. We call this the quick and dirty version of approximating this bound, because we just wanted to see if it would work, um, whether we would be able to make those same connections. And it really doesn't work with this constant that's, that's derived for the zero temperature systems. And so what we did is we used this great work um, on this parameterization. Um, by Groth and coworkers to think about, to look at the, the regimes in which they said that this parameterization should work. And we looked at whether we could find um, sort of the range of those constants that would allow us to sort of sandwich in the curves that we're able to get out at different conditions. And so here down here, you see um, 
these, so these bounds are density dependent, right? So you have this, um, the same low density regime here. And if we look at those zero temperature bounds, they're, they're down here, um, satisfied. But if we look at sort of a, you know, a pretty wide range of um, temperature values here, you can see that you get, um, you get a range of um, constants that you can put in front of this same idea, um, this idea that you have um, a relationship between the exchange-free energy that's temperature dependent and how the extent of these curves down into the negative region, right? So how low do these curves go? And you can see that even at pretty high temperatures um, that you don't actually get zero for your exchange energy up here. Um, and so that's sort of um, expressed by this, um, this top C sub top. This is our top um, bound that we have here for the numerically the numerically calculated with simulated scaling curves here. And if we look at how far down these go, we see that they're, they, they can be bounded by um, you know, this approximate numerical bound by C bottom here. And this is as far down as we find our curves to go. These are again, um, RS dependent, they're density dependent, but we can actually um, look at the extent to which these curves vary within um, this parameterization. And so this may be a first step toward looking at approximating a temperature dependent bound on the exchange correlation energy. I know that there were some people who were interested in fluctuation dissipation theorem here. So I'm just gonna very briefly um, show some of my prior results about this. This is not really current work that I've been doing, but it's stuff that I did in my PhD. And it's related to what I do since there's this relationship between the fluctuation dissipation theorem and the adiabatic connection formula. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned, right, you can write the exchange correlation free energy in terms of just an exchange correlation potential piece alone. Um, one of the things that we did is we looked at how you could rewrite this instead of integrating over interaction strength by integrating over temperature. So if you start at some finite temperature and take it up to this high temperature, high density limit, um, you can write the same thing. So we call this the thermal connection formula, um, which again might be, might be helpful if you're using methods where you have, um, you're able to describe this correlation piece um, in terms of different temperatures, but you don't have a way of sort of turning the knob on how strongly your, your electrons are interacting. Um, what we did um, is that we combine this with um, the finite temperature fluctuation dissipation theorem. A lot of folks in DFT use a zero temperature version of this um, and TDDFT time dependent density functional theory and ground state density functional theory to connect the two theories. But um, I, I believe fluctuation dissipation theorem actually started as, a, um, as something as, that was a finite temperature effect. Um, and, and folks who work on structure factor, structure factor things are used to thinking about this as well. You'll see very similar forms here. Um, but if you start from this idea that you can connect the correlation potential to the difference between the density density response function and the cone sham density density response function, um, you can write down what this is. So this is a way of sort of connecting a, uh, an equilibrium quantity this correlation potential to something that's a more time dependent quantity, right? This response function, which is how the density responds to a fluctuation in the potential. Um, but you have to do that by integrating over the frequency in that case. Um, you can combine this with either the standard adiabatic connection formula or the thermal adiabatic connection formula um, to write the correlation free energy in terms of the potential of all on its own. Um, and so what you can do is say, okay, well, if I'm interested in getting my correlation free energy in terms of this potential piece, I can use that fluctuation dissipation theorem in order to write down what that is. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant to correct this to the, um, the uh, less, less fancy version of imaginary. This still is just our imaginary part that we saw in the fluctuation dissipation theorem. Um, so here we're still looking at sort of replacing the correlation potential in this expression um, with this um, version that depends on the density density response function here. But here we're looking at the finite temperature density density response function and the difference between the interacting one and the cone sham one. 
And if we do this, you can either, you know, it's, you can integrate over temperature as we've done here, if you have access to something that depends mostly on temperature, but you can also do this in terms of um, just the interaction strength, the same way we were doing with simulated scaling before. So this is like, a, you might call this a, an alternative simulated scaling, where here, instead of integrate, instead of looking at different densities, you might be looking at something at different temperatures and densities. Um, so it's just a different way of writing down the same thing. Um, if you do this, um, because the cone sham uh, density density response function depends on this exchange correlation kernel, um, this and here the temperature dependent piece. Um, I, I know I'm going kind of quickly through this, but just so you guys see what, what I've done, um, if you want to discuss after, um, you can you can do you know sort of classic things like say, well, what if the exchange correlation kernel were zero? Um, if I do that, then I get back um, sort of this thermal RPA idea. On the other hand, you can take something like the um, parameterization that we used before that's um, you know very well respected. You could take that and you could look at um, the uh, this derivative here with respect to the density, and you could put that in as sort of um, an LDA, a local density approximation. Um, uh, but when you put this in as your exchange correlation kernel, if you do this integral over the frequency through the fluctuation dissipation adiabatic connection theorem, you actually get a different approximation to the exchange correlation free energy than you would get from just using the um, exchange correlation free energy of the uniform electron gas. Like you get information from the excited states when you do that, that gets brought in there. So you get a slightly different approximation to the exchange correlation energy. So um, I don't, to my, I don't know if this has been done. It hadn't been, I mean, we didn't do it when I wrote this down. Um, I know that some people were working on it in Kieran Burke's group at one point, but I don't think that anybody has been working on it now. Um, but other folks may have done it. I mean, you get to this it's in the same way if you use um, sort of uh, static or 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 dynamic structure factors, you can get to similar ideas for approximating the correlation energy. So that's sort of the the work in that area that I've done um, before. Since it's the end, I think I'm just gonna sort of page through these quickly. I'm not really gonna go into it, but there is a lot of work in my group going on around these adiabatic connection um, approaches. Most of this. Um, that I'll talk about is done by four people. Here's Zach and Brittany again, a more modern picture of them. Um, so uh, instead of you know, the first lunch we had together, which is on the other slides, this is a way of approximating uh, temperature dependent correlation. This is sort of like the most naive form of it, but it's called the generalized thermal adiabatic connection, which borrows some ideas from the from ensemble DFT by Fromage and coworkers. Um, and if you do this, there are ways to connect ground state approximations. Um, to, you know, by looking at just the entropic pieces. So this is something where you might be able to improve entropy approximations uh, and include more, um, more of an interacting entropy kind of picture. Um, we're also interested in, as I mentioned before, thinking about referencing, instead of this non-interacting cone sham reference, thinking about how we reference sort of the opposite. Um, some people call it the upside down adiabatic connection. Um, and this was my joke about stranger things because I guess I like sci-fi and horror. Um, but this idea that you could reference something that is very strongly interacting and think about decorrelating and defining a decorrelation energy as something that's been introduced by Michael Ziedel, um, Paolo Gori Giorgi, Andre Savin, um, and, and uh, other folks. And if you do this, um, the question for, for me has been what happens when we actually think about temperature dependence. And so um, Yuri Grossi in my group is a postdoc and he's working on sort of developing the formalism that I wrote down and confirming that I did it right. Um, and thinking about demonstrating it with the asymmetric Hubbard dimer, which is one of the um, sandboxes we play with in my group because we actually can turn the uh, interaction strength up or down in different ways. Um, and so he's looking into what it means when you do that in different ways and how we can connect this to uh, the regular adiabatic connection formula. Um, this is more information about that. And the last thing that I'll talk about is a, a paper that we have almost ready as a preprint by Sara Jaruso, who's also a postdoc in my group. Um, and here we're looking at adiabatic connection approaches that um, examine the connections between hartree fock theory, um, molar plus or perturbation, perturbation theorem and, um, and cone sham density functional theory. Um, so one of her results is saying, you know, everyone 
it keeps talking about how there are these um, hard tree Fock densities that are you know, considered better um, generally than cone to sham densities um, when you approximate things. But if you look at um, these things from an adiabatic connection formalism point of view, you can see um, where there are density inaccuracies by just looking at the correlation potential um, and, for so what she's calling the, the single determinant adiabatic connection formula, um, where you're comparing the different ways to write down single Slater determinants, whether that's through hartree fock theory or cone sham density functional theory. So that's sort of, you know, little things that we're doing with adiabatic connection stuff. If anyone is interested in that, please reach out. I'm very always happy to talk about those things. Um, I'm very grateful to all of you. This is a longer talk than I meant it to be, um, but uh, I'll, I'll blame the time being early in the morning, but I'm also very grateful to the funding that we have on this work, um, mostly from the Department of Energy. I'm grateful to CASUS for funding the open project with Attila. Um, that's working with um, Vince here, thinking about inversion methods. Um, and uh, in particular, a lot of this work is funded by the Consortium for High Energy Density Science. And I'm of course grateful for the land that we do our work on and the work that um, I've done in the past. Um, I'm very grateful to all of you. I know it's the end of your day, um, despite it being the beginning of my day. So I appreciate your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Aura, for, for this great talk. Um,